I know why I quilt, but it's my curiosity about quilters of the past, who they were and their why that has led me into the wonderful world of textiles. When I discovered the podcast, Haptic and Hue, it ticked all my boxes. Joe Andrews is a weaver and a journalist who finds the most fascinating stories of cloth. From the fashion houses of Europe to the battlefields of the Civil War, Joe shows us how textiles have impacted our world and more importantly, the lives of the makers behind them. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea and here's my interview with Joe Andrews. Welcome, Joe, to the show. Thank you so much for being with me. Whereabouts in the world are you coming to us from? First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's just lovely uh, to be on this show. I'm coming to you from the far west of France, from an extraordinary French city called Nantes, uh, which is really, if you can imagine it, a bit like a Glasgow or a Liverpool. It used to be the big shipbuilding city of France. And then when the shipbuilding all dried up in the 1970s, the French are completely rebuilding this city with enormous energy and foresight, turning it into a kind of fantastic city of creation and really vision. Have you ever seen that huge man-made elephant that travels along the street or where the little girl uh, who's worked by uh, all of the people with the big sticks. Well, that's sitting in a shed about 50 yards away from me. So I've come here before making my way to Italy, where I'm going to be doing some more exploration with tape recorder in hand for the Haptic and Hue podcast. Now, I've been following your Instagram and your newsletter, and it seems like after two years, you have gone on the road. I think everybody in Europe has gone on the road. I mean, we got seriously locked up for COVID. At times, we weren't able to move more than well, about half a mile from our own homes. We could take a daily walk, but we couldn't really go much further than that. And we certainly weren't able to travel. And I think one of the lovely things about living in Europe is that it is a very dense continent um, with lots of languages, lots of brilliant food, uh, and lots of extraordinary places and different cultures all crammed together. And it's absolutely wonderful and easy to visit. Uh, and I think everybody this year is visiting it as though they will never visit it again. And I ring my friends and say, it would be nice to see you next week. And they say, sorry, I'm in Spain. I say, well, what about next week? And they say, no, I'm going to be in Austria. And I think everybody has just kind of packed one of those tiny little suitcases and is moving about Europe as fast as they can. I have actually just came back from the Netherlands with my mother and stayed at a beautiful little town called Zuffen and just thought, I could do this every week. <laughs> Well, if you lived in Britain, you could. You could catch a train from London and be in Amsterdam or Rotterdam and go back for the weekend. And the best thing about the Netherlands is that they speak English on the whole rather better than I do. Even the tram drivers speak fantastic English. And just discovering a whole new way to travel with a point of view of textiles. Now, I'm diving deep into textiles, and I know you're diving deep into textiles, but I think we're we're coming at it from slightly different angles. How did you discover the wonderful world of textiles? I think it's always very difficult because you think it started in a certain way. And then when you think about it, you realize that it really goes back much further than that. And I realized that since childhood, I had always loved color and texture. I'm one of those people who will always go and feel things. You know, I want to feel what the linen feels like. The really important thing for me is to actually feel what things feel like. Color has always been fantastically important. When I was in my late 30s, I went to live in New Zealand and I had a small daughter at that stage. And I left my job as a television reporter and I didn't expect to have a huge amount of work. And I thought 30 million sheep really can't be wrong. I need to learn to weave. One of the reasons I decided to learn to weave was that my poor grandmothers had tried in vain to teach me to knit. Uh, and my teachers at school had tried completely without success uh, to teach me to sew. And I just appear to have 
two thumbs when it comes to anything like that. But weaving, I thought it wouldn't matter that my dexterity was useless and that somehow I couldn't understand these instructions. Because you had this flow of the shuttle from one side to the other and you had to lace up a loom, then it would be something that I could manage. And indeed, it was. And I was incredibly lucky. I lived in Wellington in New Zealand and there was a night school where they taught you to weave. And for two years, I went to night school and became a weaver. When I came back to Britain, I became a television correspondent again, traveling the world, and later as a political correspondent going to Washington, Brussels, London, Paris. We would finish the assignment and I would say to the camera crew, I think I'm just going to the textile museum. Or uh, we're in Istanbul and I know there's a very interesting carpet shop in this street. And I would rush off and see all of these glorious textiles. If I was feeling reasonably well off, I would buy something and pack it round the cameraman's uh, equipment or gear and they would carry it back, not without complaining, uh, to London. Uh, with all their excess baggage and very heavy camera gear. And really, that was kind of keeping my interest going. But I think later, when I had a bit more spare time, I really began to listen to podcasts and listen to television, really seeking much more information about textiles, because I became much more curious about how we'd got there. And I think you talk about traveling with textile eyes, and I think that's absolutely crucial. And that would be something that I wish more people could and would do, because I think it transforms the way in which you see the world. Because once you understand what these textiles mean, how they're made, once you understand the people behind them, then you understand a whole slice of human history you understand a huge amount about technology. You understand a huge amount about the effort that was required to get there. You understand a huge amount about human rights. It, it just wraps up so much of the world's history. And I think it's almost a piece of history, if you like, that's been forgotten. If we can remember it, or at least put it back into context, then it's going to give a very different dimension to what we're looking at and seeing. And I think with the Haptic and Hue podcast, that would be what I'm trying to do. I find over the past, I'm going to say 50 years, textiles has become synonymous with fashion. And I think that's been the real big light bulb for me is that they're not. They are synonymous with the development of humanity. I think one of the real frontiers for textiles has not been all the new textiles, you know, um, the textiles that glow in the dark or the textiles that are made with this, but some of the greatest discoveries of textiles have been way, way, way back, thousands of years. You and I have talked about gateway books, books that allowed us to stumble into this fantastic and wonderful world of textiles, the history of textiles and the culture of textiles. I've got one of mine here, and it's women's work by Elizabeth Whalen Barber. And the subtitle on this is The First 20,000 Years. And I adored this book, and it was the first book that I read. Elizabeth Whalen Barber, still alive, she is really an anthropologist, and she was the first anthropologist, archaeologist, who understood textiles, a weaver, and started to be able to look at really old textiles that were coming out of grave sites in different parts of the world and say, this is how it was made, this is why it's important, this is what these people were doing. The more recent research with the textile archaeologists has taken this way, way, way back. And last year or the year before, there was a discovery in a cave in East Africa where they discovered uh, the burial of a small child. And the way the child had been buried meant that they knew it was bound in a shroud. 
The shroud had long since gone. That child was 78,000 years old, and so would the textile have been, which then takes back the manipulation of textiles tens of thousands of years further than we thought. Elizabeth Whalen Barber's great cry was that the Stone Age should never have been called the Stone Age. It should have been called the Thread Age. And she believes that the technological advance of making thread was the one that enabled humanity to progress from the Stone Age into relative civilization. And it brought fishing and it brought hunting and it brought all kinds of trades and it brought clothing and it brought all kinds of things that people could make and that they could carry and that they could do and that the development of thread is absolutely central to the development of what we would loosely call civilization and that is just an amazing thought and discovery my gateway book was cassia sinclair's the golden threads and the same thing like you just realize oh the vikings would have never happened without the wool sails and the space program would never have happened without the lingerie sewers making the space suits. And I just came back from Holland visiting World War II museums and I'm looking at the parachutes. And if you watch A Bridge Too Far, you just see this scene where all these paratroopers are jumping out of these planes, but none of that would have happened without a seamstress somewhere making all those parachutes. I have a theory that every war has its own fabric. Every conflict has the fabric in it that is the fabric that everybody wants to get their hands on and they're desperate for. And I think the Second World War's fabric was parachute silk. Um, and, you know, it was for parachutes they were desperate for it. They had to find it absolutely everywhere and nobody was allowed silk for anything else except the parachutes. And the First World War, I think, um, was that kind of wool, heavy surge wool that was made, that was used for the uniforms for all of those troops. And you can just go back through history and you'll find that every conflict absolutely has its own fabric. When I started Haptic and Hugh, I had a kind of free tutorial from a very bright, young, shiny gentleman who said, wow, he said, that's interesting. And uh, he said, tell me what the podcast is about. So I told him, and then I said, it's about textiles. And his podcast was about motorcycles. And he said to me, wow, textiles, that's kind of niche. And I just stared at him and I thought, kind of niche? Where would you be without textiles? You know, you would have no clothes. You would have nothing to sit on. Uh, you know, your life would be completely unmanageable without textiles. And then the other thing that upsets me is that everyone perceives this as being something that is kind of exclusively female. Oh, well, that's very nice for you in your kind of, female gendered corner and there are a few brave men who will join you in this corner but that's not for us we're kind of upstanding men until you mention the word flags and you go well how about this little piece of textile here and that's got stars on it and then it's got some stripes on it you know what does this mean to you does this mean anything it's just a piece of textile and then suddenly they will realize that those textiles are incredibly important. And they are almost important to us and our deepest feelings are invested in them in almost every event in our lives. That is a, a kind of realization, I think, which means that you realize that haptic and hue isn't just about quilting or crochet or weaving or making silk brocade in the 17th century. It's really the story of human beings through textile eyes. So making a podcast, an audible art, <laughs> about haptic and hue, about texture and colours, that must have all sorts of different challenges. It does. 
But as a radio reporter, and I started life as a radio reporter, we always had one saying which we kept in mind, which is that radio has the best pictures. And the reason it has the best pictures is because it's sound only. And you, as a storyteller, have to work really hard to bring the picture of what you are seeing or describing to the person who is listening, because sound is the only thing that you can communicate with. I have always loved the simplicity of it because you sit in front of a microphone and it's almost like saying once upon a time to a child. I think everybody loves a story. Adults love stories, children love stories. And there's a simplicity in the story and there's a simplicity in a radio story. What I love doing with the podcast is, yes, I tell stories about texture and color through radio, but what I have learned, and it was very unexpected, was that lots of people who are makers will sit down to quilt or to sew or to knit or to make their own clothes, and they will listen to the podcast at the same time. And so the joy of it is that you can do two things at once. You can iron or do the cleaning if that's what you want, but most people don't. Television's absolutely fantastic. And yes, I would love to do a television series, but you know, at the moment, it's not something that television is interested in. But podcasting, I could set off, I can do it myself. I get a level of control over it and I don't have a huge, great budget uh, and a director and a producer saying, you must do this or you must do that. I get to describe the story and I have a really direct relationship with the people who are listening. And I treasure that and it's a privilege. And at the end of the day, if you're really interested in seeing something about the story I've been telling, then you can go to my website or you can go online and you can see the pictures there. You always get to the human part of the story. And I cannot believe how many episodes you leave me in absolute tears to the point now when I hear the theme song, my body's now <laughs> beginning to tear up. But how difficult or how challenging is it to find that story? I think that's what I'm always looking for. These are stories about textiles, but I can't divorce the human beings for the textiles because it seems to me that textiles and humans are just clamped together like this through their history. And it seems to me that the stories that textiles tell us and can lead us to are ones that have been ignored and haven't been told and are fresh and can add a new dimension to our understanding of the world. And I'm sorry if I make you cry when you hear the good tears, music. Good tears. <laughs> <laughs> One of the recent ones was about Folly Cove textiles uh, in uh, Massachusetts. And that was an exclusively cheerful podcast. There was absolutely nothing to cry about it in. I do try to bury them. Really, the feeling and the human emotion invested in the creation of textiles and the story of textiles is immense. And I keep sitting there thinking, Someone must have told this story before. Someone else must have done this. You know, and it, it, you think, why hasn't anybody else done this? And people have done parts of it. I think this is a great privilege to be at this time where people are beginning to understand that what academics call material culture has been ignored and can tell us new things about ourselves as human beings and new things about the past as well. And I think that's absolutely amazing. Well, I think also there's this rediscovery. It's, I'll use the analogy of childbirth, like doctors came in and said, well, we're going to take away all your pain. But they also took away all the good stuff that went with that process. And I think that has happened with craft. We're going to take that away. You no, not, no longer have to do that backbreaking work but they've missed that connection of working with fabric, creating, using color, and making garments to arm our, our family and friends with comfort and love. I think that's absolutely right. And I, I think there's a division here, and I think it's really important. I think we are very lucky in that we can do that as a choice. Uh, and that is a joy. And when I weave something for someone, I give them a piece of love. 
And I'm sure when you make a quilt for someone or when somebody sews something for someone, that gift comes with their love. But if you were a Victorian seamstress or a housemaid where you just had to sew and sew and sew and you were very poorly paid, or, I mean, heaven forbid, you were a kind of Egyptian slave weaver, that was no fun at all. And I don't think there was any sense of joy in that. I think that was horrendous. I think we do live in an era where lots of the toil has been taken out of it. I'm afraid to say I'm not wearing handmade clothing right now, and I don't think you are as well. But we can if we choose to. And I think that that is an enormous joy to us. But I completely agree with you that this necessity and the skill that we hold in our hands and the the intelligence almost that we express through our fingers is something that we have forgotten and we lose at our peril. And I think it's not just good for us, but it almost exercises a part of our brain and develops a part of our intelligence that we wouldn't have otherwise. Definitely feeds into mental health. Yes, I think that's very strongly true. You have previously uh, done an episode uh, with Joanna Domenjian, who I communicated with and did a podcast about on the Canadian Red Cross quilts. And I think that was a wonderful example of where unknown women stitched these quilts as a signifier of love and care to unknown people who received them. And the people who received them understood that somebody who they didn't know and would never meet really cared for them. And the emotion that came through that cloth was absolutely astonishing. And to me, that was a perfect expression of what textiles can do. They can bridge a gap. And you don't have to know the person for who you sew that textile for. And that expression of love at a time of great need came right across that huge divide. I was surprised that Joanna mentioned that a number of them went to Holland. So when I was in the Netherlands, I was asking people, they were all talking about war stories, et cetera. And I said, well, do you remember any quilts? And I was surprised with how many did. Yes, we know that a number came to the Netherlands and they came partly through the Mennonites, but also through the Canadian Red Cross. We know that some went to Germany. I'm not sure Joanna would know if any have turned up in Germany yet, but we know that they did go there. That is just such an extraordinary story. We thought that all but 250 of those quilts were lost. And yet, since that podcast uh, and since the episode you did with Joanna, new quilts turn up almost every week because people have got their eye in. They can recognize them now. They suddenly understand what they're seeing. One of the people who really knows the quilts well went to the Red Cross Museum in London last week and was looking at one of the quilts that they had. And they had said, oh, this was a POW quilt. And she looked at it. They had been told it was made in a prisoner of war camp. She looked at it and she said, no, it isn't. It's a Canadian Red Cross quilt. <laughs> because she knew precisely what the Canadian Red Cross quilts looked like. And she knew what they were back with. And she knew what the fabrics looked like. And she knew the method of construction. And the Red Cross said, oh, is it? <laughs> and so the, these quilts are still turning up. And I'm sure that there are many more of them out there yet. Now, we have just jumped from one subject to another and another and another. This is just so true of any time I do any kind of research. I start in one place and I end up five miles turning left three times. How do you keep on track? How do you condense your, <laughs> how do you stick to the story? It's something to do with what you said. So I have almost a light in my brain. So one of the things people say to me is, where do you get these stories? I will always turn around and say, what do you mean, where do I get these stories? These stories are like pebbles on the beach. They're just everywhere. There's something about a story where you will know the shape and the outline of it 
once it's semi-complete in your head. To me, it has to have a level of complexity, but it has to have human beings on it. So I wouldn't make an episode, for instance, that was just about the production of a, a certain type of material in a certain type of a factory or a town, but I would want to know how the human beings came to make or how the people who lived there and what part does that textile play in their culture? What importance does it have to them emotionally and culturally? And so when I hear these stories, I'm sort of trying to fit them almost into a kind of jug that's marked Haptic and Hugh podcast. And I often know when I hear them, and probably like you, at any one time, I've got about 30 bits and pieces that are kind of floating around and are wonderful stories, which I've had floating about since the beginning of starting the podcast. And I haven't yet quite managed to slot them into that little bit of a podcast that I want to do. Um, I went to the flea market in Paris a year ago, and uh, Rebecca Devani, who runs Textile Tours of Paris, who's a good friend of mine, took me up to the flea market and said, lots of people up here would like to meet you. And we recorded up in the flea market, and I hadn't a clue how I was going to use it. It wasn't until 11 months later, it was this September, that I said to Rebecca, I know exactly how I want to use it. I want to use it as the start of the secret life of secondhand clothes, because the flea market in Paris began as a place where people would really bring stolen in those days, secondhand clothes, because secondhand clothes had such value and worth. People, they were called moon fishermen. People would steal them off washing lines, or they would steal them off people's fences, or they would just steal clothes, bring them up to the flea market in Paris, where they would be sold off quick, no questions asked. And it was part of this much older tradition of really wearing clothing, you know, first hand, second hand, third hand, on and on and on, patched and loved and worn and worn and worn until they fell to pieces that persisted right up until the beginning of the 20th century. It can take me ages to fit a story together and to find how a bit fits in. Other times I can hear a story and just say, that's perfect. That comes exactly as it is. Lots of listeners write to me with stories and increasingly the stories come from them and they're really good at spotting them. Lots of them listen to Haptic and Hugh and they say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? My eyes are bigger than my stomach, as they say. I would love to go to India and Japan, and I would love to go to Pakistan, and I would love to go to sub-Saharan Africa. But unfortunately, I can't get there on the train with my little suitcase. It's amazing how everywhere I, I see those textile stories now, too. And <laughs> uh, it's, it's catastrophic. You're hooked. <laughs> I was just at the textile research center in Leiden. Leiden. Have you I met Dr. I don't think Jillian I'd yet? come home if I went to the textile research center. I think I'd want to sleep at the textile research center in Leiden. It was wonderful on a number of different levels, but most of all, because things were not too precious to touch. Yeah, that's you, wonderful. You could handle them uh, and they were just all over the place, but they brought out this Albanian dress couldn't really even be called Albania. It was from one group of tribes people up in the mountains. So we're talking of a small, but you would just look at it and say, oh, a wool dress a, or a wool outfit or whatever. But talking to them and understanding how this made these small women look bigger. Like it was a, it was armor in one way. But you looked up close and what you thought were just threads were actually intricately woven, squared threads. Like there was a whole technique of making these actual threads that were attached and they were sewn together in strips and patterns. And then you realize, well, from the patterns that these people wore from another mountain, you could recognize who was on that mountain. Yeah. It's just this rabbit hole you dive into. And there's a complexity in it, which is not written into the stories. There's somebody I've interviewed uh, for a, a special December episode of Haptic and Hugh, who's Claire Hunter. Uh, and she's actually the author of my other gateway book. And she wrote Threads of Life. 
which I absolutely loved. But she's just written a second book, which came out a few months ago, which is called Embroidering Her Truth. And it's about Mary, Queen of Scots. Extraordinary thing about it is, I said to Claire, look, Mary, Queen of Scots, everything in the world has been written about Mary, Queen of Scots. She's just about the best known woman on the face of the planet. And Claire said, yeah, but nothing has ever been written about her textiles or who she was as a woman. Nobody has been through her treasurer's accounts or the Scottish papers with a textile eye. And they tell a completely different story. It, it is eye-opening and breathtaking. Uh, and, and that, I find, is completely astonishing because you can get, again, a completely different slice of history uh, if you look at things through textile eyes. So I'm just going to go back to your uh, weaving for a second because you have been weaving for many years. It has lots of specialized equipment. It does, um, isn't that lovely? <laughs> <laughs> that occupies possibly a little bit more space than you want to. But how many styles and materials and techniques did you experiment with before you decided on what kind of weaving you like to do? I started off with a four shaft loom in New Zealand. New Zealand is kind of home of one make of loom, which are called Ashfords. Uh, and I started off weaving in wool because, well, I love sheep. It's a well-kept secret, but I do think sheep are absolutely fabulous animals. And I really enjoyed weaving in wool. And I kind of graduated over the years to uh, a more complex eight shaft loom. And that's been the kind of maximum that my brain can cope with. One stage, I thought I might make a kind of small living actually doing some weaving and selling the weaving. But then I think like lots of craftspeople, I discovered that my joy was in actually weaving for pleasure. And that if I was to weave to sell, I would crush all the joy out of it because I would just be sitting uh, at a loom weaving away day after day. I have a number of friends who are doctors and they trained long enough to go, ago to be trained on a number of kind of complaints like weaver's bottom. And one of my friends is a GP and she says she'd never seen a case of weaver's bottom. And she thought that if I went on weaving at the rate I was weaving, I might be the first case she'd had the privilege to inspect. Um, however, I had to disappoint her. I decided it wasn't for me, but the telling of stories definitely was for me. But I weave for pleasure. I have two looms. Yes, they take up more room than uh, anyone uh, has a right to have. And I have what's described as more than a lifetime supply of wool, silk and linen with which I weave. Now, you talked about these textiles that you you found in Istanbul and that. How big is your collection of textiles? It's not too bad. <laughs> it gets bigger. Um, I kind of hide it away in corners of the house. I'm afraid the Red Cross quilts were a terrible downfall. The story is that, that the Red Cross quilt that I described in the podcast about Canada's forgotten quilts, that had come to my mother and myself almost 30 years ago. Uh, and we had had that in the house. My mother had had it in the house. And we hadn't known what it was for decades. Uh, we knew it was precious. We knew it was special. Uh, we had tried to ring the church in Gananoque to find out where it should come from. They knew nothing about it. Um, and so we just hung on to it. And my mother has a number of textiles where she has just hung on to them. We'd had it around. And then when it went back to Gananoque, I suddenly realized that I missed it. I saw another one that came up. And so I'm afraid to say I bought it. And so I have a, I have another one that comes from a different part of Canada, which eventually will be repatriated back to Canada. And then I saw a very small child's quilt, uh, which actually came from a different charity called Bundles for Britain. I bought that too. Then I did the podcast. This is terrible, you see. I did the podcast in series one. It was the second podcast I ever did. And these were about the women who came out of the art schools in Britain in the late 1940s and 50s. And this was the most extraordinary generation of female textile designers. They had all gone to art school in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And they had wanted to be painters and sculptors and you know, graphic designers. And they turned up there 
they had been told, no, 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 dear, you're a woman. The only school that is more or less open to you is textiles. And so they had been shoveled and pushed into the textile designs and they had absolutely flourished. And so uh, into the 50s, right the way through the Festival of Britain and then into the 60s, Britain had just seen this absolute kind of flowering of textile design and people didn't have much money and their houses were a terrible mess off to the wall. But the one kind of cheapish thing that they could afford were these really bright, beautifully designed textiles. And so that was the first way in which modern design comes into British and then European homes. This generation of kind of almost completely unknown designers really brought modern art into British homes. And the designs are absolutely glorious. I'm, I'm just completing a film on one of the designers who's about to celebrate her 90th birthday. You look at the designs and you go, yeah, that's the 1960s. And it takes you back absolutely instantly. And I'm afraid I got fairly obsessed with those designs. So I was spending long time on eBay quite late at night bidding uh, for bits of 1960s textiles, which were all hidden. Uh, somewhere and kind of I, th I think they're absolutely glorious and they're bright oranges and bright browns and electric blues and things like that and then I became obsessed with paisley designs when I did the episode on paisley and I started buying this is terrible isn't it I started buying beautiful Victorian shawls that had wonderful paisley designs on them and I began to be able to tell the difference between the ones that have been made in uh, Paisley outside Glasgow and the ones that have been made in Lyon in France, hopeless. I'm afraid I buy textiles everywhere I go, but I give textiles away with every episode. And so that gives me an excuse. <laughs> well, I, I just went down the rabbit hole of African wax prints and you just realized, oh, <laughs> Well, <laughs> this is never ending, isn't it? Yeah, that's never ending. I've had some clothes for standing up on stage and doing kind of some speeches made from African uh, wax prints because I just think they're so beautiful uh, and they really make you stand out. And the, the story of those uh, African wax cloth, you know, I find that a completely global story. We spend a lot of time talking about migrants and migration in the modern world. And yet cloth has been one of the greatest migrants in human history. And it just travels kind of seamlessly and it picks up a little bit of color and a little bit of influence and a bit of new technology here. And then it moves on and everyone says, oh, this is wonderful. It comes from abroad. It's really cool and really exciting. And then it kind of changes in Nigeria and moves to Ghana and then it moves to the Netherlands. And then it, I mean, it's quite extraordinary African wax cloth, which isn't, you know, didn't begin as African and is now we regard as as completely African. We we call it African, but then so much of it is still made in Holland. Indeed, it is. Yeah. And you realize that it's actually colonialism. You know, like we decided that the the the, the tribes of Africa needed to be clothed <laughs> and here buy the cloth from us. I did an episode about it and um, what the Dutch did was they colonized what's now called Indonesia. And they saw this very beautiful handmade wax cloth that is made in Indonesia, which has real cultural significance to this day in Indonesia. And they decided that they could make it more cheaply in the Netherlands and sell it back to Indonesia. So they did that, but the Indonesians said, no, we don't like it. And one of the thoughts was, they thought the Indonesians didn't like it because they said it didn't smell right, because it didn't actually smell of wax, because it had all been made on a machine. And so somehow the Dutch end up with a, they end up with a large stack of machine-made wax cloth, which they thought the Indonesians were going to buy, but the Indonesians said, take your horrible wax cloth away, we don't want any of it. And so they had to offload it. And so they took it uh, to West Africa, where it sold really well because it was a kind of seen as a cool foreign product. And the British also made it. And the uh, women in West Africa who sold it who were incredibly powerful, became quite rich. They were known as the Mama Benzes um, because they were the first women to be able to afford to buy Mercedes Benzes in 
the West African countries where they sold the cloth. And they would sell either Dutch wax cloth or English wax cloth because the British did exactly the same. And they, in Ghana and Nigeria, called it Dutch wax cloth or English wax cloth. And it was smart because it was foreign. And of course, we think it's glorious and its design has been tremendously affected by the desires of the market. And one of the clever things that both the Dutch and the English producers did was they listened to the Mama Benzes, who said, nah, I don't want those kind of pallid nonsense colors. I want bright red, or I want this design, or that design doesn't sell well. And so they shaped the production of it according to what the market in Ghana and Nigeria wanted. And now it gets sold back to Europe as African wax cloth. And we think it's cool because it's foreign and cool and it comes from somewhere else. So it's, it's this kind of wonderful traveling story where it picks up different influences from different places. You have themes. Do you start your season knowing the theme or does it appear as you're producing it? No, I start the season knowing the theme, but it sometimes goes a bit haywire. I, I try to start a season knowing that I will have eight cut and dried episodes and they will be about this. Uh, and then what happens is that somebody or somehow I will stumble across a story that's so fantastic that I can't not do it. And so this story, which for one reason or another hasn't turned out quite right, will get shoveled out. And this other story will get shoveled in. And then the moment it's threads of survival and that's been quite loosely interpreted. And <laughs> I then, noticed that. <laughs> and then um, I've got another couple right at the end, which I've got just got to get into this series. So it's going to go on for slightly longer than eight. It's loose, but I do try to start with a general theme. I think it helps me because I think textiles are otherwise kind of such a huge area you could get easily distracted. And I, I I try to focus it down a little bit. This year with your your theme of survival, it's been interesting watching how you interpret it because realizing that the term survival can be interpreted so many different ways. And just talking about your last one with the the printers in Massachusetts, you know, survival because they've managed to these prints have managed to survive i wasn't sure about that story it's a story about largely women makers who were people who lived in a community uh in cape ann in massachusetts and they were people who were primary school teachers worked in a post office worked as secretaries they had absolutely no professional training as textile designers. And yet they all produced some of the most captivating and beautiful arts and crafts designs that I have seen that came out of America in the last century. And yet they are almost unknown. The person who sat at the center of this was Virginia Lee Dimitrios, who had done one year at art school as an became an illustrator, but she had really strong ideas about design and she taught them all around her kitchen table. And it was really the story of people in 1930s, 40s, 50s and 60s America and how this small community was set alight by this one woman who turned them all into the most phenomenal textile designers and how they printed and made and sold their own fabrics. And the you know, wonderful stories, the department stores in the 1950s come calling and they say to Virginia Lee Demetrius, please sell us the designs and we will produce these properly commercially. And she says, no. And they say, but madam, you have uh, the most extraordinary Buick there. It, this is just, you know, what we would say in Britain, the Rolls Royce of design. And she said, no, I prefer my Ford, go away. When she died, they decided to give up any of the printing of the fabrics and the whole thing stopped. And all that is left is what you can see in the Cape Ann Museum. 
And it's a story that has a start, a middle, and a finish. It's a very small story. Uh, it's a story about one community, one set of prints. And yet, the minute you see the prints, most people find them absolutely entrancing. They were. They were. I looked at the the, the pictures, the, the notes that you provide, and uh, I'm actually trying to figure out how I'm going to get there before the... <laughs> <laughs> One really doesn't like to go to New England in the winter time, but maybe no. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the best lobster roll available when you reach Gloucester. It has fantastic good seafood there. It's a wonderful place. Now Gloucester is pretty close to where they filmed that movie, The Perfect Storm. Yes, it's it's an interesting place because it's got this one level of kind of gritty. It's a gritty New England fisherman's place. And then it's got these kind of granite quarries, so it's got more grit. And then it's got these kind of artists. It's got Winslow Homer, who comes up and paints there in the summer, and T.S. Eliot's family, who, you know, as a young man, T.S. Eliot goes up there. And so it's, it's this really extraordinary mix. And in between it, these people from Folly Cove, who, yes, there are some artists among them, but also there are some people there who are just, you know, ordinary teachers and mothers and fathers and uh, carpenters and one of them had worked in the granite quarries and people had been soldiers. They were just, if you wanted to do this, you didn't have to enroll at an expensive art school. Virginia would just teach you around the kitchen table. And isn't that the tr truth of so many crafters and makers? You yes. know, this is something that they do for love. They can still have the genius after <laughs> years of practice. Yes, it is. It's something, and I wish that I had been able to learn from my grandmothers, both of whom did carry within them tremendous skills, which partly because I was very left-handed and uh, also partly because I wasn't able to sit still for more than 30 seconds when I was a child. They weren't able to teach me to knit or to crochet or to sew. I've acquired the patience to be able to sit still enough now to be able to do those things. But they had tremendous skills. It's lovely to be able to learn those skills without having to read a book and pass an exam. But for those to be life skills just in the same way as uh, your mathematics exam is or your engineering exam is or your English literature exam is. Um, but you don't take an exam in quilting. But it's nonetheless a really good skill that you do have. I just say on the um, on the same trip that I went up to uh, Massachusetts, I also went to George Washington's home uh, on the Potomac, Mount Vernon in Washington. And we've talked a lot about having textile eyes. When you go to Mount Vernon, it is filled with people going in and out, just crowds and crowds of people who are really there to honour the father of the American nation. I got there and looked at it with textile eyes and realized that what George and Martha Washington were trying to create was just a kind of textile production factory. And that they had sheep uh, and they had a weaving shed and they grew flax. And it, it was kind of recognizable as a place where they were producing and wanted to produce a quite large quantity of textiles. And so they had, we started talking about textile production, which was not something I had kind of expected, but at Mount Vernon, that's what it was there for. It was there for textile production and it was a working plantation, working farm, uh, where textile production was its main output. And once you start to talk about that, you really begin to look at the place in a different light. Well, speaking of uh, the Washingtons, Martha Washington, there was an interesting article I read uh, last year about one of her dresses. They're trying to find the maker of the dress and how they went through the records and found the women that were enslaved that, that had made the dresses and the intimacy that George Washington knew of them you know, like, oh, could they fix this? And can they fix this? And when they actually escaped and got their freedom, the bemoaning and wanting that good seamstress back, 
but opening up the seams in the dress to see the textiles and the gaudy color, well, what we consider gaudy now, were a fashion statement, and not only a fashion statement, but a display of their wealth, because they were colors that only the wealthy could could afford. They took me down into the fabric and clothes storage rooms there, which I thought were absolutely extraordinary. And they have a lot of the Washington's clothes stored there. Two or three things. One is, yes, they showed me one of Martha Washington's dresses. And it's one of the dresses that was designed by an 18th century woman designer in Spitalfields in London called Anna Maria Garthwaite. It's all kind of circulating, doing a circle here. It's it's all collapsed. (laughs) Oh, Martha Washington had an Anna Maria Garthwaite design dress, and I was able to look at it, not touch it, but to look at it. The other thing they had there, which I will do a special article or a little bit of a podcast on, is they actually had two things there. They had Martha Washington's swimming costume, which it is not what you and I would consider to be a swimming costume, but it's a very long shift that would have covered her right to her ankles. And it is hand-woven from hand-spun linen. And it's quite possible that that was uh, grown, spun and woven on the Mount Vernon estate. Uh, they don't know that yet. And the other thing which I found completely extraordinary, uh, and I'm not quite sure how to approach it at this stage, is Martha Washington's corset. What grandchild or great-grandchild saves their great-grandmother's corset, I'm not sure. But here you have Martha Washington's corset, which is saved and conserved with extreme reverence. And it is a very, very human garment, uh, which bears, in some senses, all the marks of Martha Washington as a human being and brings you closer to her and makes you see her as somebody who really lived as opposed to this sort of uh, icon uh, of American history. I I found it absolutely astonishing to be able to see it. I would like to see that episode. (laughs) (laughs) January. (laughs) So if people want to get a hold of you, how do they find you? They just go to the website, www.hapticandhue.com, and my email is there. People make suggestions all the time. I get about 70 emails when I put out an episode because I always offer a free or always offer textile-related gifts. Even if you don't get the gift, I will always reply to the email just saying, I'm really sorry you were too late this time. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. It has been delightful talking to you, and I hope we can catch up in person soon. That would be lovely. Come back to Europe, and I'll take you on a tour of London. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Jo Andrews. Her podcast, Haptic and Hugh, is worth your time. I just love hearing the connection that we have with the makers of the past and the cloth that I collect and love so much. I also love that she has a complete transcript of her podcast, plus the photos on her website. If you want to learn more about the podcast, Haptic and Hugh and Joe Andrews, I will leave a link to the website, the podcast, and her contact information in the description notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Meredith Woolnuff. Her sculptural embroidery work will take your breath away. And she's going to tell us all about it. Be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when it goes live. Next time you're in your sewing room, have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting people on this show. Let one inspire you. And check out my latest video right here. Take care and I'll see you next time.